everyone please be seated we are going to start the next session Dear Chairman, dear colleagues, welcome back. We shall now commence the third session on disease biology and healthcare. In a world made smaller by ease of travel, diseases, particularly the communicable ones, are becoming a global healthcare problem. Coordinated efforts. In a world made smaller by ease of travel, diseases, particularly the communicable ones, are becoming a global healthcare problem. Coordinated efforts to understand the emergence of new diseases as well as discovering new therapies for currently incurable diseases is the need of the hour. In addition to this, disease management practices, given the cultural, economic, and geographical diversity, is also an important area that can benefit from scientific exchanges. Thus, this HCO conclave envisages bridging these gaps by promoting scientific collaboration and information sharing among the participating countries. Here is a gentle reminder, during the talks, we shall be streaming your live videos next to a, your PowerPoint presentations for both virtual participants and speakers who are present among here. For speakers who are present with us here, Please raise your hands to identify yourself while your presentations are being played so that the camera may capture you. Virtual participants are requested to turn on their cameras while the presentations are live streamed. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the thematic session where we will be taking the question from both virtual and participants present here. For asking questions, the participants present here may raise their hands and our volunteers will come with the mic to help them out. For the online participants, kindly type your questions in the chat box and we will be taking them at the entire, at the end of the entire session. This session is chaired by Professor Hemlata Balram and Dr. Kushagra Bansal. Professor Balram is a professor in the Molecular Biology and Genetics Unit in JNCSR and Dr. Bansal is an assistant professor in the Molecular Biology and Genetics Unit. Let's now begin the session. So, our first speaker for this session is Saurish Ghosh, Senior Scientist, CSIR, Indian Institute of Chemical Biology, and the title of the talk is Stomach Viruses, Hide in Salivary Gland and Transmit Through Saliva. Yeah. AVT. Welcome everybody. Today I will be sharing uh, with you a fascinating story that has changed some of the dogma in enteric viruses. Hi, I am Sourish Ghosh, Senior Scientist at Indian Institute of Chemical Biology, Kolkata. So, uh, this story got published in Nature last year where I showed enteric viruses like rotavirus, norovirus and astroviruses uh, to be replicating in salivary gland and transmitting through saliva. Now, uh, before going into the details, let us revisit some of the conventional hypotheses regarding entry viruses. Now, combining, uh, combinedly, uh, these three viruses account for 1.5 billion uh, infections per year globally and a major cause of mortality and morbidity associated with entry diseases uh, accounts for significant economic losses. Uh, Regarding their basic biology, they replicate in intestine and shed into feces and transmit by fecal route to host 
via fecal contamination of hand, food, water and surfaces and now all these uh, were conventionally known before the publication of this paper. I developed the infection model for enteric viruses, uh, rotavirus and norovirus uh, in 10 day old mouse pups. Uh, the mice were orally inoculated uh, with murine strains of the viruses, the MNV1 and the EDIM. Uh, and thereafter they were left uh, with the mothers to suckle till the weaning date. As observed in other cases of uh, virus uh, replication, uh, the norovirus and the rotavirus were found to replicate in the intestines uh, till the three day post inoculation and from the five, fifth day onwards uh, the virus seemed to clear out from the system. Now it is interesting to note how these uh, young pups were able to clear the viruses so fast as early as five days without having a developed immune system of their own. Now uh, to answer that, now the secretory IgA was measured from these uh, pups intestines which are known to be pr uh, primary players in these uh, viral clearances. I observed a spike in secretory IgA release from three day post inoculation onwards and hand increased henceforth uh, in case of the in case of both the infection models. Uh, since these uh, pups were feeding from the mother's milk, uh, I, I, I uh, measured the secretory IgA from the milk of these mothers and through the course of infection for both the infection groups. Surprisingly, the secretory IgA uh, levels uh, spiked from three day post inoculation onwards as observed in case of the pups intestine. So what does this uh, signify? It signifies uh, the, the role of secretory IgA from the mother's milk in viral clearance of this uh, from the intestines of the pups. Specifically we found murine norovirus and rotavirus to be replicating in the mammary gland and in, in the epithelial cells of the mammary gland and in the B cells of the, or the plasma cells of the mammary gland. Uh, so now the major question comes like how do the enteric viruses from the pups reach the mother's mammary gland and how does the mother sense her pups infection and increase her milk secretory IgA production. Now to answer this from our conventional hypothesis, mothers living in the same cage uh, of uh, infected pups may be ingesting the virus by licking these pups uh, and as the viruses are seen in the intestine, uh, the antibodies are transferred to the mammary glands to secrete in the milk. But again, this process takes more than a week. So where we observe, uh, uh, so whereas we observed the uh, secretory IgA spiking within three days post inoculation. Now to test our hypothesis, I orally inoculated an age match uh, mother without its pups in the cage and, uh, and observed no change in the secretory IgA production in milk uh, and also there was no replication in the mammary gland till the four day post inoculation but the infection was right the, there, there was high titers of viral replication in the intestine of these mother. So where uh, these virus inside the mammary gland coming from? Is it during the suckling? Is it through the saliva? So I developed uh, this uh, protocol or method for uh, collection of saliva from these adult mice and extracted the, uh, the saliva and found that the virus present over there are infectious in uh, and not only that when they were re-inoculated to these naive pups the viruses re replicated in similar titers as viruses obtained from the feces what does it tell it tells that saliva transmission is a parallel route of uh, entry virus transmission as observed in case of the feces uh, transmission. Now uh, again uh, we observe uh, the replication of these viruses uh, in the uh, submandibular glands from both the pups and adults. Thereafter I developed uh, uh, the in vitro models for these 
viruses in salivary gland, organoid culture and also epithelial cell lines. Now it is surprising to note that <coughs> these uh, noroviruses, uh, human norovirus which didn't have a model till date now were replicating successfully in this salivary gland epithelial cell lines and not only that the virus inside the vesicles are more infectious compared to the free viruses as observed in case of the RT-PCR and FIT. And to summarize uh, uh, the study, the salivary glands uh, are replicating these viruses acutely and persistently uh, and also shedding uh, the virus, uh, infectious virus through the saliva. Now as per the new uh, uh, CDC recommendation, there will be new sanitization measure because not only this will be designed for fecal oral transmission but also for the saliva transmission. This uh, article, uh, this uh, report uh, got publicized in both internationally and nationally in various journals. Now, uh, as, as an independent scientist, uh, I'm working uh, on uh, several questions. The major two questions that I'm following is how these viruses, the enteric and respiratory viruses are persistently replicating in salivary glands. Does the microbiome has a role to play in, that, in this? And to develop postnatal therapeutic strategy of mother neonate diet by studying the cellular and antibody mediated immune response to local infection in mammary gland and to strategize immunotherapy through mother's milk. And uh, with this, I uh, acknowledge all my lab members, my mentors, in, uh, and are my collaborators and the core facility people and uh, last but not the least the funding agencies who provided me uh, all the support and thank you all thank you for an interesting talk now we move forward to the second talk by Pastiev Alaskai Nikolovich senior researcher Fedrov eye microsurgery complex federal state institution May I ask you to please raise your hand? Dear Chairman, dear colleagues, let me please greet you and share our experience with femtosecond laser assisted posterior lamella keratoplasty, the contemporary technique of corneal transplantation. Endothelial dystrophies of the cornea is a group of diseases associated with dysfunction of its posterior epithelium, leading to reduction of visual functions and pain. Endothelial dystrophies of the cornea is a widely spread disease. The average prevalence of fourth endothelial dystrophy is about 3.5, 4.5 of people elder, percent of people elder than 50 years. In Europe. It's about 4% of the population. In Japan, the percentage is a little bit lower, about 2.53% of the population. In, in Russia, mm, the prevalence is 4.1% of our among patients with cataracts observed in its federal eye microsurgery complex, federal state institution. Rate of women to men, 3.8 to 1. To one. Bullous keratopathy is a consequence of surgery, usually cataract surgery. Prevalence of bullous keratopathy is increasing each year due to the aging of patients and increasing number of cataract surgery procedures all over the world. Transplantation of cornea is a um, way to solve this problem. The most commonly uh, type of corneal transplantation is penetrating keratoplasty, but this type of surgery also is associated with a high risk of complication due to open sky surgery. Also, this type of surgery is associated with high postoperative astigmatism um, and long-term visual rehabilitation. Also, risk of transplant rejection is quite high. Um, the scar threat is low. Mm, there is no full innovation of the transplant, and it's this type of surgery 
leads to lower tear film stability. A sterile lamella keratoplasty is more perspective from all these points. It is associated with lower risk of complications, less postoperative astigmatism, faster visual rehabilitation, less immune response, higher biomechanical stability. The innovation of cornea is preserved with this type of surgery and it allows to keep uh, the anterior surface of the cornea intact. Femtosecond lasers provide the opportunity to make predictable cuts of different shapes in the corner and the perspective lamella surgery. The most common way of creating a donor transplant for posterior lamella keratoplasty is applanation of laser interface from the posterior side of donor corner. This approach allows to gain regular transplant of predictable shape and thickness. The effects of femtosecond laser energy on donor corneal tissue were explored. Endothelial cell loss evaluation was performed by donor corneal endothelial staining. Calcium AM made the opportunity to visualize live cells, and propidium iodide um, gave the option to visualize dead cells. Femtosecond laser and mechanical microkeratom showed equal endothelial cell deaths in all samples. Another research explored the effects of two different femtosecond labels on endothelial cell death um, using a confocal microscope for endothelial cells visualization showed equal endothelial cell death in two groups. Ethnic was microscopy was used for evaluation of the surface of the transplant. Femtosecond laser comparatively with mechanical micro microkeraton showed equal high quality of the surface. The further research made with ethnic force microscope of the next generation showed the equal result um, visualizing the high quality of the surface of a transplant becomes with the femtosecond laser. To represent the efficiency of the technology, I would li like to represent the results of rehabilitation of 45 patients with full endothelial dystrophy of the cornea. Russian high frequency femtosecond laser was used for transplant procurement. Ultra thin transplant procurement is being provided by the direct applanation of laser interface to uh, endothelium of donor cornea. Um, uh, the process usually takes not more than 20 seconds. After deleting the destimous membrane of the recipient with not healthy endothelium, the transplant is being implanted and unfolded in the anterior chamber of the patient's eye and is being fed by the air bubble. A three-month observation period transplant engraftment was observed in 98 cases. In two cases, primary graft insufficiency was observed and recreatoplasty was performed. Not a single case demonstrated transplant dislocation. A three years observation period transplant engraftment was observed in all cases. A three years observation period, a 60 2% of patients achieved high visual functions uh, with corrected visual equity um, equal or higher than 5 lines. Maximum corrected visual equity was uh, 10 lines. Astigmatism was 1.25 diopters and hyperopic shift was very low, plus 0.25 diopteries. At three years observation period, total corner thickness was 541 micrometers, central transplant thickness was 82 micrometers, tensor periphery index was 0 
and the total density was 1521 cells per square millimeter and the total cell loss was 41 percent so femtosecond laser allows to procure ultrafilm transplant within age uh, with regular surface without risk of perforation uh, femtosecond laser assisted posterior lamella keratoplasty is associated with minimal risk of dislocation of a transplanted postoperative period and allows to provide high visual and functional outcomes in long observation period. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the wonderful talk. We now move forward to the next talk by Fayaz Malik. He's a principal scientist at Indian Institute of Integrative Medicine, CSIR. And the title of the talk is Exploring Key Biological Factors, Targets Associated with Poor Clinical Response to Available Therapies and the Discovery of New Target-Based Agents. May I request you to please raise your hand? Council of Scientific Industrial Research, CSIR, and the Institute is live. I'm Fayaz Malik. I'm Fayaz Malik. I'm on the onset. I'm highly grateful to the organizers of meeting. We have given the opportunity to be here and share my uh, research findings with the audience of different backgrounds so that we can find a common niche. I work with Indian Institute of Integrative Medicine, IIM, which is uh, one of the laboratories of Council of Scientific Industrial Research, CSIR, and the institute is located in Jumu and Kashmir. Our core research interests are in identifying the key biological mechanisms <coughs> that drive the drug resistance in highly aggressive breast cancers. Besides this, we have also established a discovery program in our lab where we are actually trying to identify different small molecules that can be used in combination with the existing therapies to overcome their drug resistance. Apart from that, we have recently found our interest to look the factors which are maybe responsible in the differential treatment response of antidepressant drugs in patients based on the patient sample analysis. Triple negative breast cancer, TNPC, are one of the most aggressive and metastatic uh, subtypes of breast cancers. Uh, which is different mutations. Yeah. And uh, studies have been shown the higher oncogene AKT expression actually leads to poor prognosis in the patients and the lower AKT shows a better prognosis. Our, we are curious to know, since AKT has three different isoforms, what is the role of each individual isoform in the stemness or in the aggressiveness of these uh, type of cancers? So to understand the role of each AKT isoform in the invasive and migratory properties of uh, the cancer cells, so we did a single and double knockdown of each isoform in MCF10 and BT549 cells, and it was observed that uh, the knockdown of uh, AKT1 and 3 led to a more aggressive behavior of the cells due to the presence of AKT2 isoform in the cells. 
So showing the liquidity to the driver of aggressive nature of cells amongst the three types of hops. Studies from last two decades have shown that uh, to attain the aggressive behavior like metastasis, uh, therapeutic uh, resistance, and tumor recurrence, these cells need to acquire at least stem cell like features. So, to understand how each acidosis of form actually influences the stemness of the cells, uh, so our models have shown that. It was actually AKT2 which actually drives um, the expansion of stem cell population, as can be seen by the different assays which we have performed here. So, like uh, the top one is the mammals, and the next one is the color of the indicating that AKT2 plays the key role in. We try to understand how this is related towards the treatment option of the chemotherapy agent cisplatin, which has been used as the first line treatment option against triple negative cancers. Interestingly, it was observed that the loss of AKT1 expression made cells to become non responsive to the cisplatin treatment, as was observed by the apoplotic markers of case phase 3 and PAP cleavage. So, the expression of AKT1 actually led cells to become responsive to the cisplatin treatment. Based on this, we use these cells and put them in the mice model of tumor and again observed that loss of AKT1 expression was actually uh, non responsive to the cisplatin treatment in mice as well, showing that while it is more efficacious to develop now clinically relevant. Isoform specific inhibitors rather than bionectin inhibitors, and while designing the treatment of this protein, the expression of each AKT isoform should be taken in consideration. Uh, like that, several studies have shown that there is a small minuscule population of stem cells in each cancer which are normally non responsive to the current therapeutic agents, that's why the tumor occurrence happen. So, on on these lines, our studies have shown that when we treat those cells against triple negative breast cancer with Pachytex, which is one of the treatment options for triple negative breast cancers, the Pachytex was unable to target cancer stem cells, and the cancer stem cell box was like a relatively but expanded from 6% to 21%. So, having said that, we now made a combination of the field which we identified triple line one by two, again, in combination with the Pachytex cell, and the results were. You know, remarkable and we saw that the cancer stem cell population went down from 21% to 0.2%, which would be the different treatments of triple uh, IM1 and IM2 along with the tactics. Chemotherapy has shown that the combination has actually reduced the tumor burden in the mice. And the very important factor which we observed here, uh, which is not shown here in this slide, is actually we put these primary tumors in the second batch of mice and let them grow here. And it was found that uh, all in all the groups, uh, in all or some of the mice have formed the tumor, but the group which got the 
tumors from the carbonation treatment were unable to form the secondary tumors, showing that the tumor recurrence has actually, you know, stopped uh, in the carbonation treatment. Amongst the four clinically classified subtypes of breast cancer, over two positive breast cancers consist of 25% of the total breast cancer patients. Monoclonal based antibodies like trastuzumab, bortezumab are the gold standard therapies towards these type of breast cancers. However, there is a considerable portion of the patients who either don't respond to these therapies or become resistant during the course of treatment. Our lab has established different similar models of cross-sectional resistance where we have been able to actually identify the key driving factors that are responsible for the resistance to the first group. For the generation of a co-resistant model, we created the beta doses of trastuzumab of the cells for almost a year. And then we generated a novel resistant model. We deleted the pitin expression in those cells. In the both the models, we found is an elevated expression of the phosphokinase under the resistant conditions. Major depressive disorder is a neuropsychiatry disease that has not only found a steep increase in the number of cases recently globally, but also has found a number of increased trend in cases in Asia as well as in India. So the current treatment options which has which are there has been there for a long time and there are serious issues with these uh, therapies that almost one third of the patients either don't respond to these therapies or there is a, another considerable population who even respond to these therapies early become non-responsive during the course of treatment and uh, the treatment options are have not changed much uh, from last couple of decades so we have started you know collecting the patient samples uh, based on the response to the current uh, ssris so we will do the high throughput proteomics analysis in these patients so that it can help us to understand so what are the key factors that are responsible for the disparity to these treatments and this figure just is out of curiosity we just tried to see like the number of patients we took and you can see the brain derived neurotropic factor is a very important factor and plays a huge role in depression and see how the control healthy animals healthy people have like you no know, good expression of pdnf and well depressed patients have a very low expression of pdnf and uh, when some patients who are responding to ssris are having better pdnf expression they are of depressed patients and so is a case in non-responding recurrent patients apart from collecting clinical samples we are also trying to correlate uh, you know these uh, data of clinical samples with that of mice data. So, because in mice we can exercise the brain of the mice, and uh, we use two models of mice by inducing chemical and uh, physical stress in them and uh, exercise the brain of the mice and do further studies so that to find a correlation between our animal model and the humans. And further, uh, additionally, we also established a drug discovery program for antidepressants in our lab, where we have been successfully able to find few molecules which are as good as that of clinical candidates like SSRI. And we are expecting in the next few years, we are going to take them forward as a preclinical candidates. Thank you for the illuminating talk, Dr. Faraz. Now, moving on the session, we shall be hearing a talk from Astha Mishra. She is senior scientist uh, from CSIR Institute of Genomic and Integrative Biology, Delhi. And the title of the talk is Expanding Insights into Genes and More Than Just Genes at High Altitude Environment. Greetings to everyone. I am Dr. Astha Mishra from CSIR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, Delhi. And my scientific talk is on expanding insights into genes and more than just genes at high altitude environment. Genes, of course, we understand are the basic unit of hereditary material made up of DNA and the variations in the DNA sequence among the populations are the ones responsible for the inter-individual differences. However, more than just genes are the DNA modifications as a result of environmental cues such as diet, disease or our lifestyle that take a major role in regulating the DNA by switching genes on and off. Of course, we all are more than just genes 
and to understand this in detail nothing is better than the high altitude region so let's take a quick look on what the high altitude is so it is the region that have elevations more than 2500 meter above sea level the region is characterized by the unique exposome of low partial pressure of oxygen, high ultraviolet radiation, and low temperature. The percentage of oxygen in the atmosphere remains constant, which is 21%, but the atmospheric partial pressure of oxygen reduces proportionally with barometric pressure. Exposure to such harsh environmental conditions results in a reversible process of physiological acclimatization to optimize the supply of oxygen to tissues. Millions of people travel to high altitude every year. High altitude areas bordering our countries, north and northeast regions are especially strategic and challenging and demand thorough preparedness for the country. The outcome of such studies can assist in better management of the adverse clinical outcomes in visitors, tourists, religious pilgrims, and so on. High altitude is a natural laboratory setup for studying hyperbaric hypoxia, not just in the gene environment interactions perspective, but also on a time scale of human adaptation. And also the pathology of many common cardiovascular, respiratory and inflammatory disorders observe hypoxia. The lessons learned under high altitude environment can be made applicable to these patholo pathologies. Human survival is dependent upon the continuous delivery of oxygen as it is pivotal to maintain tissue functions. Human beings have evolved a sophisticated oxygen sensing system. Therefore, when a cell encounters hypoxia, it activates hypoxia inducible factor, the master regulator of oxygen homeostasis, which transactivates more than 1000 hypoxia response element bearing genes. Hypoxia also modulates the cellular environment directly both in parallel to and because of HIF activation. This occurs through a combination of oxygen sensitive to oxoglutarate dependent dioxygenase enzymes that are designated as oxygen sensors and have significant role in HIF stabilization and DNA modification. For HIF stabilization, the proline hydroxylase enzyme which is encoded by EGLN gene hydroxylates HIF to facilitate its degradation. In recent years, several laboratories, including ours, observed a strong natural selection of a region of EGLN1 gene in high altitude environment. Hypoxia also induces changes in chromatin through DNA modifications driven by demethylesis and may further contribute to the phenotypic alterations to hypoxia stimulus. These demethylesis can be hydroxylated by the same prolyl hydroxylase enzymes that hydroxylate HIF. As a result, our focus went into the evaluation of altered methylation state of targeted genes affecting transcriptional and physiological responses to hypoxia. And for this talk, my focus is on target regions of EGLN1 gene. So, with the aim of understanding the functional consequences of the genetic and epigenetic modifications of EGLN1 gene in the high altitude environment, we adopted a case control study design comprising of high altitude pulmonary edema patients, also known as HAPE and healthy controls. So, HAPE is one of the acute mountain sickness that develop upon rapid ascent to altitudes in otherwise healthy individuals. It is a non-cardiogenic edema characterized by hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction as seen through pulse Doppler measurement, endothelial dysfunction and intravascular fluid retention as seen through X-ray. HAPE subjects, they have lower blood arterial oxygen saturation levels as compared with the controls. Here, the controls are the healthy sojourners that visited altitudes under similar conditions and did not have any adverse clinical outcome. We also found the upregulation of both the genetic and protein expression of the gene EGLN1 in the patients. Not only we found the differential distribution of three variants, RS1538664, RS479200 and RS480902 of this gene between patients and controls, but we also estimated that these variants as the regulators for this gene. The risk allele of the variants were associated with the clinical levels and with the gene expression. The next slide is a busy slide. 
but in a nutshell and based on various results, we can say that the three SNPs appeared crucial in affecting DNA binding of transcription factors and were involved in allele specific differential expression. The risk variance as compared with the wild type variance showed elevated expression that could be detrimental to HIF, HIF activation. Through the gene protein interaction experiments, we were able to highlight the best three DNA protein complexes. FUS RNA binding protein, it attracts many heat shock proteins that are associated with stress management. Rho GDP dissociation inhibitor is a multifunctional molecule that seemingly associates with hematopoietic and diuretic activities which are major clinical issues in susceptible subjects in the high altitude environment. And hypoxia upregulated protein 1 belong to the family of heat shock proteins. The pursuit of EGLN1 regulation at high altitude continued by investigating the epigenetic roles in terms of differential DNA methylation distributions and their association with the clinical outcomes. A significantly lower methylation distribution of CPG sites was observed in patients as compared to control. Overall, the methylation percentage correlated with the upregulated plasma EGLN1 level and decreased blood arterial oxygen saturation levels. So, to conclude, we can say that the genetic setup of EGLN1 gene appeared relevant in the regulation of the gene by the differential distribution of their variant elements and the respective transcription factors in the healthy and susceptible subjects. And the significantly lower methylation distribution in EGLN1 and the consequent physiological influences annotated its functional epigenetic relevance in hate diseases. I would like to acknowledge my director for giving me space and necessary space and infrastructure, Dr. Kathir Pasha and Dr. Tashi Thindas, who are my collaborators, my students who are instrumental for the experiments, of course, all the volunteers and participants, and lastly, the organizers. Thanks to everyone for their time. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, now, the next talk is by Neha Khatri. She's working as a principal scientist at CSIR Central Scientific Instruments Organization. And the talk, the title of the talk is Indigenous Development of Highly Ultra Precision, Precision Engineered Value Added Optical Components for Healthcare and Energy Sector. She'll be presenting online. Uh, I Can I request you to turn on your camera? Dr. Neha Khatri, if you're present online. May I request you to please on your camera? Please. A very good morning to all of you. Myself, Dr. Neha Katri. I am working as a principal scientist at CSR CSIO. First of all, I would like to thank Department of Science and Technology for selecting me as second SEO Young Scientist Conclave and giving me an opportunity to share my views in this platform. Quickly, I will introduce myself. I am working as a principal scientist in the Department of Manufacturing Science and Instrumentation at CSIR CSIO Chandigarh Lab. My field of specialization is optomechanical instrumentation and my broad research area is optical system design and fabrication of optical modules for soft X-rays, infrared optical elements as well as the molecular dynamic simulation based uh, modeling, ultra precision machining of optics, improving the figure as well as the finish accuracies in the nanometric range. I'm also working as an associate professor in ACSI, which is Academy of Scientific and Innovative Research for postgraduate and doctoral academic activities. Now, the title of my talk is Indigenous Development of Ultra Precision Engineered Valued Optical Components, specifically for the health as well as the energy sector. 
As we know that in this era of nanotechnology, the deterministic high precision method are of the utmost important as well as the need of the present manufacturing scenario. So the need of the high precision is basically to achieve a defect free surface to make the functional part across the wave, entire range of the wavelength spectrum with improved surface quality and controlled form errors to reduce the abrasions. To achieve such high precision, the methodology of design, fabrication and characterization is adopted, which includes the molecular dynamics simulation modeling, fabrication by ultra-precision machining techniques, by diamond turning, magnetological finishing, CNC grinding, polishing, etc. And last but not the least is the characterization, that is quantification of the surface quality by using various techniques, interferometry, uh, scanning electron microscopy, uh, X-ray diffraction techniques, and etc. So the motivation behind this work is basically to develop a novel process protocols which are alternative to the slurry laden grinding and polishing process towards sustainable manufacturing to machine difficult to cut materials and exhibiting a very good surface. Since my area of specialization is optomechanical instrumentation, I am very fortunate that I have been associated with a very broad range of the electromagnetic spectrum for the development of the optical instrumentation for the healthcare as well as the energy sectors, which I will be discussing in my coming slides. Yes. So, first is the design and development of the aspheric lenses for visually impaired. As we know that visual impairment is one of the major health concerns all over the world. There are various problems which are associated with the visual, low vision persons, like there is a loss of central vision, which leads to instability to recognize distant objects. There is a loss of peripheral vision, like the difficulty, mobility, and navigation. And there is an overall blur, which leads to reduced contrast with completely blurred vision. So, in order to uh, help these low uh, vision persons, we propose to switch from spherical lenses to the aspheric lenses. Uh, the difference between the spherical uh, as well as the aspheric is that in spherical, the surface is defined by a constant radius of curvature, whereas in the aspheric surface, the radius of curvature is constantly changing, but the surface is rotationally symmetric. So, the benefits of switching from spherical to aspheric leads to low fatigue factor due to the reduced rate, improved performance due to the less abrasions and losses, and low cost as moving from glass to the plastic. Optics. So, in this work, we design and develop uh, high adapter 26 adapter lenses for visually impaired persons, and we study that the defocusing effect on the point spread functions for a peak to valley for the spherical as well as the aspheric lens. It was found that the defocusing effect for the aspheric lens is reduced while for the spherical lens, as the sharpness of the peak is low in the case of the spherical lenses. We further fabricated the lens for the glass as well as the plastic. And we found that by switching from spherical to aspheric as well as from glass to plastic, there is reduction in one third of the weight. So these lenses were distributed to visually impaired persons and we had certain critical trials at the following institute. The another engineering intervention for healthcare management in which I have been associated is design and development of microlens array for biomedical imaging. Optical coherence tomography is a non-invasive technique which is used for the 3D imaging of the biomedical tissues. The working of the OCT is based on the interference phenomena between a local reference signal uh, as well as a signal uh, from the object which is under the investigation. It is used in the biomedical domain for the various applications like ophthalmology, endoscopy as well as the examination of the gastrointestinal tract. The disadvantage of the uh, OCT is the extended depth of focus which is which lacks in the present conventional spherical lenses. So in this work we have tried to increase the lateral resolution which depends upon the numerical aperture of the lens. So we try to switch the spherical lens to a micro lens array which homogenize the incident light over a wide range of the biological tissue of the sample and it also extends the depth of the focus with the transverse resolution. So this is the workflow which is used uh, uh, starting uh, which starts with the optical design as well as fabrication and the characterization. 
So in this, uh, we have designed the uh, MLA is optimized using the multi-parameter optimization method for the uniform incident light illumination. So the material which is used for the LMA is a zinc selenide, which is a very difficult to cut material. But having the advantage of uh, is that it has a wide uh, transmission over a wide range of electromagnetic spectrum. So here we can see that uh, the um, MLA is fabricated, uh, which is a micro lens array by a single point diamond turning, and it is further characterized by using the white light interferometry. So MLA is the desired or the fabricated MLA, it has the desired surface roughness as well as the form accuracy, which definitely leads to the depth of increased depth of focus, uh, which can be used for the biomedical imaging application. Further, I have also worked on the design and development of safety goggles to combat COVID-19. Now, as we are aware that COVID-19 is a highly infectious virus which is transmitted through the droplets released in the air by coughing and sneezing. But so the conjunctiva uh, membrane which is located inside the eyelid to lubricate the eyeball is only the exposed mucous membrane of the body. So when the eyes are opened, the conjunctiva membrane is also exposed, but it is often overlooked for the entrance of the virus. So for this uh, work, uh, we, we proposed the development uh, like protection, sorry, the protection of the mucous membrane of the eyes, nose and the mouth by using the safety goggles. So we developed uh, these safety goggles, which are agronomically designed to provide the full cover as well as efficient swelling to the eye area and protect the healthcare professionals from hazardous aerosols as well as other suspended particles. These developed safety goggles, they meet all the requirements according to the NC standard, that is 87.12010. All the physical requirements as well as chemical requirements having a contact angle of 133 to 135, which shows the surface is hydrophobic and they have the luminous transmission greater than 85%. This is a methodology used for the fabrication of these goggles. CNC machining for the fabrication of the mold, diamond turning for the precision fine tuning of the mold in terms of accuracies of form, injection molding and this is the molded safety goggles. For the uh, last but not the least is my contribution towards the energy sector. I have worked for the development of precision optics for the soft x-rays. As we know that there is a growing demand of focused as well as the collimated beam for variety of engineering and scientific applications. So this beam is used for the examination of the samples with high spatial resolution as well as the high system throughput. So in the case of the x-ray where the wavelength is very short ranging from 0.1 nanometer to 10 nanometer, the optical surface quality requirements are more stringent because if a if a light get reflected from an imperfect optical crystal it get uh, it get diffusely reflected which reduces the uh, uh, contrast that is signal to noise ratio and also reduces the optical throughput so through this project through this work we develop the novel technique to uh, make the silicon mirrors of armstrong roughness level so that they can be used in the generation of the x-rays and which can be used for the further examination of the samples with the high spatial resolution so based on my work carried out in the healthcare as well as the energy sectors, these are some of my research accomplishments which are listed here. Further, based on the work carried out in this domain, these are the national as well as the international collaborations which are developed. Like we are presently working with uh, Cranfield University UK as well as University of Arizona. A collaborative research is taken up with the world leading institute of optics in the area of freeform fabrication and metrology. We are also having a collaborative R&D effort is initiated with RRCAT Department of Atomic Energy for the deployment of super smooth silicon mirrors for X-ray. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you for your interesting talk. Now we will be moving forward with our next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Su Likhon. He's a professor, Southwest University, Hello. China.
and the topic is tannic acid derived anti falling and antibacterial surface coating strategies Here. can i request you to please turn on your camera everyone thanks for the invitation from MOST China and thanks for the wonderful host from India side my name is Xu Li Xun I work at the School of Materials and Energy Southwest University at Chongqing China my presentation topic is tannic acid driving anti falling and antibacterial surface coating strategies the occurrence and the colonization of a Plectonic bacteria in medical devices and in plants triggers by falling or by film formation, which causes serious infections. According to statistics, we, it was estimated that around 722,000 in hospital infections occurred in the U.S., with a mortality rate of 75,000. Therefore, who overcome the problem associated with bacterial pathogen, there is urgent need to develop novel and universal surface coating strategies. Uh, many anti folding coating technologies and uh, superadiphobic surface were developed using various uh, functional polymers, enzymes, and other active molecules. Similarly, the conductiling and uh, uh, release killing antibacterial surface were developed using various antibacterial agents. However, uh, developing biocompatible coating technology is an essential criteria for biomedical applications. Polyphenol, the ubiquitous secondary metabolics of plants, are important part of human diet and are essential for plants' upper functions. They have attractive function. Uh, uh, in consider they have attracted a considerable interest due to their important biological activity, activity as well as interesting chemical and physical properties. Various interactions, reaction between polyphenol and the interesting molecules were used for the construction of functional materials and design of versatile surfaces. TA's excessive poly uh, phenolic functional groups, TA has uh, 15 phenol groups, provide good coordination site for bio-inspired surface engineering and the post modification. Various physical and chemical interactions, including hydrogen bonding, uh, hydrophobic interaction, uh, polyphenol mental coordination, uh, electrostatic attracti attraction, microaddition shift-based reaction, and uh, other uh, infections were contributed to chair drive and surface coating. As a result, device, uh, diverse uh, tannic acid drive and surface engineering approach have been practiced in material science research by exploiting anti adhesive polymers, antimicrobial agents, photoactive materials, and ionic coatings. In the first study, we have developed a sustainable anti pulling coating of bromo functionalized uh, agarose and, uh, and tannic acid to form the uh, agarose, uh, tannic acid containing agarose, agarose TA. The increased surface roughness attributed to the successful surface uh, deposition of agarose TA with improved stability at different pH conditions. The agarose TA coated surface is displayed significantly less amount of protein absorptions. The protein repellent capacity of agarose TA coatings can be attributed to the repulsive force associated with the presence of a hydrogen layer on the hydrophilic surfaces. Similarly, the agarose TA coating protects the substrate from bacterial adhesion.
These results indicate large the surface morphology and a uniform hydration layer of the aqueous TA coating plays an important role in inhibiting bacterial adhesion and the protein folding. In another study, uh, we our team has disclosed large the amino moieties integrated the TA the TAA can be used as a universal colorless coating platform to functional side uh, functional surface with hydrophilic PG uh, biotin group and uh, antimicrobial silver nanoparticles. The surface deposition of TA could produce colorless and uh, material independent surface coatings on uh, various substrate surfaces. The tannic acid coating facility the grafting of peach branches on the gold surfaces, resulting increased protein repulsive against the BSA and the FBG. The titanium TAA cell banana particles exhibits antibacterial activities against the E. coli and SRS, depleting its antibacterial and anti-adhesion properties. It is assumed that the TA could generate hydrated electrons, reduce radicals or other reactive species on the UV radiation, which quickly reduce silver ions to form metallic uh, silver. UV radiation promotes the rapid deposition of TA silver nanoparticles coating in a substrate independent manner. The gradual release of silver ions from the, sub from the surface responsibility Possible, possible, possible uh, for bacterial effects with minimum toxicity. The developed uh, surface functionalization strategy will be useful in preventing bacterial contamination of the acid, alumina, and other fine materials. In this work, a passive coating strategy using mental polymer composite is formulated for anti-polling and the photo-induced bacterial eradication. Gold nanoparticles uh, has, uh, possesses higher chemical stability and biocompatibility, which are widely used for photothermal scraping. The successful deposition of uh, tannic acid, the PEG, and the golden uh, coatings on substrate surface, except uh, glass, could enhance their hydrophilicities. Photosomal is regarded as a safe and efficient strategy to deal with bacterial infections. The strong photosomal efficiency of PDMS, uh, TA, PEG gold uh, coating suggests that this surface possesses higher stability for a long term and can be used for repetitive photosomal applications. Subcutaneous implantation of the prepared substrate with SRS, inoculation and uh, NII radiation eliminated uh, the bacterial adhesion and the base uh, suitable conditions for antibacterial photosomal therapy. So this work provides a prospective strategy with excellent performance for anti-infection medical devices. In conclusion, the use of TA open new possibility for bacterial treatments in all terms of approach, including falling release, pentakiling, release killing, and the photosomal therapy. The inherent biocompatibility of TA modified biomedical implants represents a broad spectrum of tissue engineering and regenerative medical devices, uh, medical applications. Uh, thank you for your listening, and thanks my team member and the financial support from MOST. China and the NSFC China. Also, thanks my collaborator in here, the yeah, Professor Murugesen and Dr. Nanashek and Gopi Nash. Finally, uh, welcome to Chongqing, a beautiful city of mountain, and uh, to enjoy the hot pot. Thanks. Thank you for your talk. Now, the next talk will be presented by Adumarova Zagmyor. And the title of the talk is Advantages of Ultrasound Imaging of Osteoarthritis of Hip Joint. She's in person.
the organizers and participants of the Young Scientific Congress. I'm happy to cover my scientific work about advantage of ultrasound imaging on hip osteoarthritis. Currently, as you know about hip diseases, according to the World Health Organization, more than half of people over 45 years old develop osteoarthritis. But after 60 years old, I was 100 persons. In 2019, the global incidence of hip osteoarthritis is 20.5%. In Central Asia, slightly more, 30%. And global rates of osteoarthritis, hip osteoarthritis, past 30 years in Central Asia, very high, 40%, but in the world, 9%. And in United States, America, 27% of the population over 45 has hip osteoarthritis. Ranking second most frequently knee osteoarthritis. And as you know about standard imaging methods of X ray is hip diseases, uh, but it detectable bone changes in advanced stage of osteoarthritis. So it starts recognizes early stage when pathology changes are noted in soft tissue of joint. And MRI is gold standard too, but is very high cost and insufficient availability the scale of the masses is limited. In our country we have some problems which consist of the role of ultrasound in the diagnosis of the hip joint pathology, absence of ultrasound criteria for staging hip joint disease and ultrasounds for hip joint puncture. In our aim of research consists of improving the effectiveness of radiology diagnosis of hip osteoarthritis using ultrasounds. We have several tasks in our research which uh, consist of study ethnographic signs of hip osteoarthritis which determine the degree and determine criteria for detecting early stage hip osteoarthritis according to ultrasound with PD and develop modified ultrasound classification system the degree of hip osteoarthritis and develop algorithm, use research methods and evaluate it as a role ultrasounds for therapeutic hip puncture. In our research consists of the totally 163 persons. We study these persons and we delete to group control and primary. In primary group consists of two diseases, rheumatoid artery etiology uh, diseases and osteoarthritis with degenerative diseases. The degenerative disease consists of the fourth stage of is patient's disease. And our study, uh, not only ultrasound with uh, liner and convex transducer, we use X-ray, laboratory methods and MRI for verify of our diagnosis. And in ultrasounds, help to see very, very help to see joint effusion. Uh, joint effusion, it's good see in intraantrical joint uh, when between the neck of bone and into the fibrous capsule and any heroic signals, it uh, must be this distance, must be more 7 mm, it means joint effusion. And when in this disease, in these pictures, 50 millimeters. We can see synovial hypertrophy, 6.9 millimeters in the second picture. And it means the inflammatory, and we can see synovial inflammation in ultrasound mode using PD, the highest signals of red signals in ultrasounds. We can see in ultrasound osteophytes not only in the head but we, we see in the neck of the bone. And ultrasounds we may see not only ultra osteophytes but you see erosion uh, which means in rheumatoid arthritis. And we can compare the ultrasound degenerative disease osteoarthritis with the X-ray examination, which help to see uh, bone deformation, head deformation, osteophytes, and other symptoms. 
and then when we compare the control rheumatoid arteries and the osteoarthritis group we see the interesting fact to in rheumatoid arteries in our hypertrophy 9.5 millimeters and the culture goal must be 5.2 millimeters and in rheumatoid arthritis we see uh, hypertrophy fibrous capsule and in the uh, Doppler graph letter of femoral artery in osteoarthritis it's interestingly see similar cartilage 1.3 millimeters and big size osteophytes same point five millimeter but in rheumatoid artist osteophytes it's smaller and when we compare the rheumatoid arteries and osteoarthritis, we can see joint effusion, interarticular effusion in rheumatoid arteries 46 percent. We see fibros capsule 50 percent, synovial hypertrophy 44 percent, and synovial PD 74 percent. In osteoarthritis, it's interestingly osteophytes big size 48 percent. Signal cartilage 59 percent, and we can see deformation of the femoral head 36 percent. In basically on the rock analysis, we use ultrasonography indicators, particular cartilage and osteophytes, and we can see in the first stage cartilage must be from one to 1.5 millimeters and after if two stage 0 0.8 millimeters and such is very more senior must be osteophytes size is big size we can see in so and four stage of hip joint osteoarthritis and uh, i want to short say about uh, hip joint function in our country, several doctors to use only traumatology and orthopedic doctors to use uh, hip injection by blunt, blunt methods. And uh, we, our results say about uh, we offer hip injection with ultrasound navigation because it's helped to reach it faster entry of the puncture needle into the joint cavity and help the elimination joint damage and is easy to tolerate by patients. In this picture you can see needle and in this picture you can see needle and translin aligner transducer. In the conclusion yeah, I have say about summarizing the above one can focus on the experience of the ultrasound examination of hip joints by ultrasounds. We must combine it with PD uh, and it's help to criteria the hip joint osteoarthritis, the severity and activity of the process. And we must use ultrasound with the other methods together the clinical, laboratory and radiology methods and it's help to optimal diagnosis complex of planning and monitoring treatment and as well as prognosis of the diseases. Ultrasound methods with PD help is simplicity, exploitation, economy and non-invasiveness and absolute safety of patients. It's very important to use ultrasounds as one of the basic methods of diagnosing hip or osteoarthritis. Thank you for your attention. If you have some question, you are pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, so now uh, there is a little change in the program. We'll take all the questions at the end of the session. Now we can break for the lunch and our volunteers will help you out. And please come back by two because we'll start sharp at two. Thank you. <laughs>